You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, today we continue with part three of uh, Jay Reynolds' wonderful lecture on gardening. And on Monday, if you'll tune in, we'll tell you what's happening here and uh, what we're preparing for and uh, what we intend to do about it. So uh, you'll get all that information on Monday. Right now we're working feverishly, preparing documentary and uh, sourced information in the law on our position. We will be preparing a web page on our website, which is http colon forward slash forward slash harvest dash trust dot org. That's harvest dash trust dot org. Sometime, um, hopefully Sunday or Monday, you'll be able to go to a web page and see what's going on here, see the uh, uh, legal position that we have taken and that we will continue to stand upon and uh, what our plans are and uh, what we're doing. So look for that. If you have a computer, you can access the Internet sometime Sunday or Monday and find that information. Monday's broadcast will be devoted in whole to the current situation that's going on here. <laughs> We expect sometime after the 1st of July to be under siege by the federal government. We will stand and fight. We will protect our rights. We will protect the property that we have been entrusted with to care for. I will always protect myself and my family with every means at my disposal, bar none. You can count on that. I took an oath when I was uh, in the Air Force and then later in the Navy. I served my country under two military branches. And that oath was to protect and defend the Constitution for the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I have never been released from that oath. I will never release myself from that oath. And ladies and gentlemen, I will fulfill that oath. I don't care what the rest of you do. You can turn into the biggest bunch of abject cowards and, and uh, rationalizers and bullshit artists that exist on the face of this earth, and you can explain it away yourselves any way you want to. But uh, my family and I drew the line in the sand a long time ago. We will resist tyranny and evil wherever we find it, even unto death. Okay, get your pen and paper out and get ready to uh, listen to the rest of Jay's uh, wonderful talk on gardening. Anybody know? Lime. Lime. To bring it more in the uh, acid is a little harder. Any ideas for how you can make soil more acid? Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Sulfur. Sulfur will do it because then that sulfur mixes with uh, water. It will, it will form a sulfuric acid. You can also use vinegar. Yeah. Right. I'm serious. You can put vinegar in a spray bottle okay. and just spray it light, throw the vinegar over the soil, and it's just enough to make Now, it's easier to to um, to bring a soil towards alkaline than it is to bring a soil uh, an alkaline soil towards um, acid because generally the alkaline soils have so much calcium. It's really hard to do it. But if you had a, a terrible alkaline, an alkaline soil, even, you got that around here, you might have to 
to uh, do something. Compost is a good idea, though. It's a real good idea. Probably better than than uh, the double salt. It's alkaline and it's clay too. Mm-hmm. Which calls for lots of compost. Now, clay soil. I'll, I'll give you a little secret that that uh, I found out. Um, a clay soil. What a clay soil is is the finest soil. There's no soil that's the particles are finer, but they they tend to be shaped in a plate structure, like plates, and they pack together tight. That's why a plate is so hard. And um, in order to loosen a clay soil, you can use lime to do that. It will help to loosen most clay soils. Now, another thing which is kind of fun, um, there's a substance called Ammonium laurel sulfate. Anybody know, ever seen that before? Or know where they've seen it? It was in my chemistry set when I was a kid. Okay. <laughs> you had a lime bottle turned green. What again? But you had a lime bottle turned green. Lawns? Maybe. Yeah, I'll That's it. It's the, first, the second ingredient behind water in a sh- in shampoo. That will loosen a tight soil, believe it or not. Ammonium lauren sulfate. What you want is um, the um, no name, generic, cheap shampoo. Just in this line. Yeah, that's one form of line. And uh, but but uh, that will help to to loosen up. I quite saw it, believe it or not. And I don't think it I don't think it's harmful. I haven't found it to be harmful. I don't think so. I think it's a phosphorus, right? That's generally a, a source for phosphorus. But I'm not I'm not positive, but I I haven't heard of it really being used for that specific thing. How about sand? Sand can loosen up the swells too. But um you have to be hauling a, a big load of that if, if that's if that's what you need to do, you can't do it that way. There's a lot of sand. It often helps drainage, too. Yeah. Compost will do it, too. Any organic matter will loosen up that soil. And we need to have our organic matter higher and higher and higher. Um, over time, like Bill was saying, we've depleted our soil. When you, when you take a strictly this is one of the problems with chemical fertilizers, uh, for instance, nitrogen, especially nitrogen. If you have a soil that's high in organic matter and you put nitrogen to it, that organic matter breaks down and burns up. If you keep doing that and don't ever add any organic matter, what's going to happen? You're going to, you're going to, well, you're going to lose your organic matter, and that is one of the main things that gives life to the soil. It uh, it also holds moisture better, and it provides that acid to break up the uh, clay particles. And uh, that's one of the main reasons why why we hurt our soil is for too much chemical fertilizer, and nitrogen especially. I got a positive thought. Huh? When the Red Army shows up at the door. Think positive. Think of them as just hurry up for your soil. I don't want to mention you got compression. Tell me something. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 Guano, seabird, or or uh, bat. First one you're too. Well, your, I believe your second would be pig or human, then goat or sheep, then I'm not sure whether a cow or a horse would be the strongest. It, I believe horse would be stronger than cow. They have a shorter digestive system. And we'll we'll take this up after a break, okay? Well, right. so, um, right. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. We're just changing the tape, and that's just going to take uh, you know maybe one or two minutes, and uh, the lecture will continue. Let it run.
Well, uh, what I what I had left on the page last time was composting. Some of y'all already have compost piles. Can you tell me about it? No. They think they drink water. You can cook in them. Yeah. What What does it mean if the compost pile is stinky? Perfect. You said what? Meat? And what you say, Bill? It's not maintained properly? Yeah. Yeah, in general, that's true. Uh, just to give you a basic uh, idea of the compost pile, the first one was probably when a uh, a farmer fed his animals uh, and in a pen or something and they built up he took it out and dumped it and saw it got hot like I said before but uh, if you were going to build one here's, here's how to do it you need two components two components would be something with carbon in it and something with nitrogen in it and the more nitrogen, the faster it will decompose. The more carbon in it, the more you'll have left over when it finishes. Believe me, it can really melt down to almost nothing. The other thing you need is water. Because, believe me also, if, if you don't have enough water, you'll almost end up with a pile of ashes when it's done. It's just really dry. So, the amount of water that you would want to put in there is about equal to what you would have left in a, in a damp sponge after you squeezed it out. Just about like that. If you're going to put in hay or a lot of dry stuff, you'll have to water it. So, if you're going to build a compost pile, have a source of water close by so you, so you can water easy. And, Generally, a, a compost pile will have those things in it. Um, you can put some soil in it, some dirt. That will that will help out too. That kind of tends to um, how do I say it? There's just something about if you add a little bit of dirt, even a little bit of old compost. Some people use for a starter, just like yeast, like you would make bread. So it's a, a heat is required. If you have too small a pile, it will not be able to generate heat to keep itself going. And I usually found them about five feet high and I'll build it up like that. But uh, to start off with, you, you do it in layers. You have a layer of a carbonous stuff and a layer of nitrogen stuff. Got any idea of carbonous stuff? Leaves. Leaves, yeah. Hay or grass. If it's dry, the, the grass would count for carbon, but if it was real green grass, it would count for nitrogen. Um, some people even use a certain amount, a small amount of newspapers could be put in there. But if you don't get your pile, if your pile doesn't work right, you'll see those newspapers later on. They they started, they used to use some inks in newspapers that are not, that wasn't good, but now most of it's uh, soybean ink and I don't think it will hurt anything. But uh, you can use just about anything. And they say not to put in uh, meat products, I think uh, anything that has a lot of fat will tend to seal seal it up. But um, in Arkansas, they have lots of chicken farms, and they do compost the uh, dead chickens to dispose of them. Because what happens in the, in, these, in the pile, you'll build it up layer upon layer, and uh, bacteria will start to grow in this, and it will generate heat. I guess the only other thing I didn't mention in there is oxygen. It probably needs to have some oxygen or else it won't work right. So, uh, 
in the middle it will build up in heat and I think you can get somewhere under 200 degrees at the most, probably 140 is about what a good pile should make. To take the temperature you get a stick and stick it in there and once in a while you can pull it out, feel on the end of it, feel how hot it is. And really and truly, you can compost dead animals, human waste, you can compost anything. And that's probably the only way you really should use human waste would be to compost it and try to get it right in the middle, not all over the outside. When it, after a time it'll, it'll cool down. That's when you need to turn it over again, put, putting the, the stuff that's on the outside over beside it. And it's gone. And then taking the rest and, and layering it on the top. Because that outside, it won't decompose at all. It'll look just like it, it did in the beginning. And when you, uh, when you're finished, what you'll end up with, you can use it before it's finished. I uh, to say before it's finished. You don't have to turn it into some, into its most basic form. You can use a certain amount of the leaves that are kind of crumbly and maybe it's some twigs or, or whatever. So you can use it before it turns completely black. In fact, what will happen is it'll start, it'll start to heat up the second time, the third time. If you're lucky, it might go a fourth time, but probably not after that. You can leave it again and let it age more, but it's really not going to do, do anything for you after that. It's probably at its best. What you're doing is you're actually are eating up some of that, that free nitrogen. But what you're turning it into is humus, which is something the plant can use just as well, and it, in turn will re-release the nitrogen later on. It's not a, a fast acting fertilizer, but it's a long acting fertilizer. So, if you wanted, like to, if you had a plant you really wanted to give it a quick boost, you probably, you could use some manure around that plant instead of the compost. But the compost is a long-term process. It's, it's something that will build the soil real good. And if we can't go to the store and buy fertilizer, that's, that's a good option for us. You can put just about anything in there that's organic and natural. Any questions on the compost? Do uh, you recommend some of these terrible type things that they, uh, that they rotate and all that? What, what's your opinion on that? They were, and you could use them, but you're not going to get very much. If you think about it, I think um, you're going to reduce what you start out with by at least down to half. So when you start out with a, a barrel full um, and you end up with a wheelbarrow full, that's just not going to go very far. Now, a small garden, yeah, it would, but you really could depend on something that small to feed yourself. Now, I use, I do it with a pile, in a pile, because I, I really try to do a big amount. But some people have a good luck with bins. It kind of keeps it more neat, keeps it together. Make sure you make two bins so you can move it from one to the other one. You have to have a place to, when you, that's the easiest way to turn it, is to just put it in a completely different pile when you turn it. Mm -hmm. um, if you live in a rainy, wet, rainy area or it's going to be winter and there's snow, should you, you should cover it now? Yeah, for the long term you should cover it. And I like to build mine under a tree too. It makes it nicer to work, work in and it probably protects it a little bit. A dry area you might want to leave, leave the uh, top a little flat to catch water. But if, if you, you really should have a water source, no matter what, no matter where you're gardening, you probably should. <laughs> and, but yeah, for long term, you should cover it up. Or else, put it on. Go ahead and use it. Make sure you get a good heat. Or else, uh, if you put something in there with seeds, they'll come up. And if you use, uh, if you throw tomatoes, rotten tomatoes and stuff in there, you probably, and use open pollinated tomatoes, you probably never need to plant tomatoes again because they'll come up and you'll find all kinds of neat stuff coming up. 
tomatoes come up good and a squash, pumpkins. You can get a lot of good seedlings out of the compost pile. Oh, put worms in there, though. The heat will kill the worms. Put the worms in the garden after you've added the compost. Yeah, you sometimes can find the worms in the soil under where you have a compost pile, though. Yeah. They'll, they'll go, they'll live down in the soil. They'll come up and grab something and take it back underground. If you're looking for a uh, fishing worms, that's sometimes a good place. An old pile, they'll, they'll move in there pretty good, too. But it's true, uh, one thing with chemical fertilizers, it does tend to, uh, especially if you go heavy with it, it'll tend to kill off worms in your garden. So, if you can use compost, you won't be killing off those worms. Anybody know what the worms do? Yeah, when they tunnel, they, they make uh, air places in the soil, so find water places so the water can go down. Yeah, they, their, their manure is just as good or better than anything else, any other kind of manure. So, works are good. I, I saw a, uh, on a website from Australia, a fellow went to a homestead, some land, he asked for the worst land they had. I don't know why he was trying to prove a point. What he did, he, uh, he planted mango trees, on this red soil that had no grass whatsoever, been overgrazed in a drought, and just was the soil was in a terrible state. And then uh, he would put rocks, large flat rocks, underneath these mango trees, and put uh, worms on them. They could stay under the rock and do pretty good. But then he planted a certain type of grass or plant, and it took him some years, but he turned that into a productive farm where it was the worst soil that, that uh, anybody had and he never touched a plow for the ground. It just worms. Well I've got one more hand out here. I passed out a, a sheet to talk about gardening, gardening versus farming. But I didn't do much explanation on it, and now's the time I'm going to work on that, so you might look at that one too. That was had to do with square foot gardening. And uh, what I'm going to tell you about is, way, is ways to get more out of a given amount of soil, a given amount of land. And that's good because if you can get more out of the same amount of soil, you have less work in general. Less weeds to deal with. You got. You need less compost. Although the more the better. It goes. You can put it on heavier. In other words, and um, on a small scale, this works. Whereas it doesn't work so good on a large scale. What I'm talking about is the is a method. It's called the deep bed method or a bed planting method. You know uh, when we see corn and wheat grown big farms, they'll have long rows, but uh, that's not always the best. The main reason why they do that is so they can drive a tractor down through there and do all the work. So, the alternative, uh, say, say this is, you're in an airplane looking down and you see the corn growing in a row like this and another row, like this. Could be cabbage or whatever, lettuce or whatever. And the tractor wheels can go through here, and go through here. So you've got a path in between each row. And they can drive down with cultivators and scratch the ground here to keep weeds out. But the way that it's become popular lately, instead of doing it like that, you would possibly do three rows of corn. Now this is looking at an air from an airplane, looking from above. And uh, and then you would have a path where you could walk. There's a footprint. There's another footprint. Big guy. What you've got 
is three rows in the place of maybe two. And you've got a path on each side. What you've also got is the leaves from these are tending to shade the ground. That's going to keep weeds down because they don't like to grow in the shade, most of them. It's also going to shade the ground from the sun. So the water will stay in there better, will dry out so much. And it's become popular even with some, some farm crops. It, it doesn't work maybe so good with corn, but the smaller plants it works real good on. If you look at it from the side, what, what, what it really is going to look like is a bed and a path. And then you can continue on with another bed and another path. And you plant your plants here. And walk here. Got any, do you, anybody have an idea of what all this helps? Besides shading? Uh, get more plants per whatever. Yeah, less path, more plants. Any other ideas? Uh, less weeds. Could be less weeds. Yeah. There's, another, another, there's one thing that plants need that a lot of people don't think about. They need water. They need air. Believe it or not, plants need air. And this helps air to go in to the uh, soil. The race part, plants can drown. If you've got a heavy soil and you get water just sitting there all the time, plants can drown. They need air. The... Um, Organisms that live in the soil, they need air too. In order to break down that compost and produce what the plant needs, it has to have some air in there. So this, this helps also. Another thing it helps, if you've got, um, now this would be on a, a little bigger scale than I should have shown maybe, but if you've got two rows and you walk up and down here all the time, that ground is going to get packed down. And when it gets packed down, water can't go in there. It might seal up the ground even. So you're not um, packing down where the roots are growing. You're packing. You're walking a path instead. Another thing, when you uh, when you farm this way, and you go to put your compost on the land, you put. You're usually you just kind of have to spread it because you don't may not know exactly where you're going to plant later on. So you may actually be fertilizing your path where your roots are not going to go. When you grow in with a bed system, you're going to put your compost right on here and not on the path. So you're not going to use, you're not going to waste it that way. Um, I started doing this a few years back when I had my farm in the Virgin Islands and not many people had seen it. People used a lot of hose and, and single row methods, but it really can work. And one, I used to also use a lot of mulch. Mulch, what mulch is, is uh, some, an organic material. Some people use plastic sheets, but I don't like it. An organic material that lays on the soil and does these four things on the handout. Controls the weeds. It hold, helps to hold water by acting as an insulating blanket. It helps to prevent erosion because the water doesn't actually hit the strike the ground. It takes a little bit of time to infiltrate through that mulch. And some soils that are that it rain when it rains right on the soil, it will actually crust it and make it impermeable. You know, it won't it won't take up any water after it gets packed down by just by rainfall. And when the mulch sit there long enough, the uh, little worm will come up at night and grab a piece and take it back down deep in the ground and use it and then turn it into manure for you. It'll disappear. I've seen mulch completely disappear and I didn't take it anywhere. Some, some uh, little worm took it. So for mulch you can use all kinds of things. Um, grass, hay, leaves, pine needles, bark, 
wood chips, sawdust, cotton seed hulls, rice hulls, or any agricultural waste. I know they use a lot of sugar cane in, in Hawaii, right? That's good for mulch. We use that for... It does one of the things, too, Jay. Mm -hmm. It provides heat around the plant as it begins to decay. It keeps the plant warm at night. It should get a little bit too cool. And it provides the heat above the roots. You never want heat around the roots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I had never experienced that, but it probably does help when you're in a hot situation, a cold night yeah. situation. I have noticed one thing I've never seen before until this year, but early, early spring, I got frost in the path, but I didn't get frost on top of the bed, and that's because the low, the coldest air fell down in there, and uh, it didn't, it didn't uh, frost my ceilings, whereas it, it did, it did frost down in the bottom of the path. That's the only place that had it. So. There's another reason, I guess, that I hadn't thought of. Now, in the Virgin Islands, I used to cart this, go to a field that the fellow let me cut any amount of grass I wanted. It was tall grass, called guinea grass, but it was about this high, and real thick, heavy. And I could cart it, take it back, spread it out, but that was a lot of work. I, I had two acres that I had mulched, and so I'd go with my pickup truck, Weed eat it, cut a little weed eater, fork it into the truck, haul it, fork it out, spread it. That got to be a lot of work. One day, I, um, one season, I let a piece of one bed go and turn into grass. I just wasn't, I was busy doing something else. I didn't have a plant there, anything planted. So this bed grew up in grass. Well, I had to go and cut it down before I did anything, so I cut it down. I threw it over on the bed next to it, and I started thinking, hey, that's, that was pretty easy. I lost that bed real easy. So eventually, my two acres was a strip of grass and a strip of crop, and a strip of grass and a strip of crop. It took half my land, but I found that it, the labor that it saved and the extra production that it made it, it made up for it. Plus, what I would do is, every other year, I would change them around. I'd pull the grass up from here and plant it over there. So I was rotating half of my soil all the time. It worked really good. Um, the island has had a, purchased 2,000 acres of former sugarcane land. And I really tried to get people that, and this was supposed to be subdivided into plots that people could use for gardening, but there was no water. And my farm didn't have water either. We had a, a saltwater well that just couldn't use for irrigation anymore. But we kept having crops without water, and we won prizes. So I really tried to get the um, government to do this and mechanize it with a, a machine that would just run down the uh, row and, and throw it over on the side. When I left, actually, they were considering it, but as I found out, they haven't ever done it. And I don't know why, but um, it could really make a big difference for them. I don't know if you all have any... I haven't found a, a grass crop in my climate that could do that, though. It, the other grass was so productive year-round. Maybe there is. I, I looked at one called comfrey. You ever heard of comfrey? It's a herb, but also grows real thick and real big. I, I've got one bed of that started to see if it'll be able to make enough for the next bed. Well, that's kind of a side, but have any, has anybody grown in beds before? Well, I just work the gardening thing. Mm -hmm. It's basically the same idea. It's a uh, the main ideas there are that you don't walk on the place you plant. It's a permanent bed, and um, it's raised. What what the raising does, it gives you more room for air, more room for your roots to go into undisturbed soil. Strawberries are, are one that commercial companies are, are using with that. 
They've even developed some machinery that will build the beds behind the tractor and uh, plan on your money. You know, from California, I think they do, do it out there. Some people do use the plastic. I'm not in favor of it because it doesn't do three of the things that are on this list. Well, it doesn't do two of them. It says, you can say that it prevents erosion, but all it's doing is sending the water somewhere else to erode somewhere else. It does prevent soil packing, but it doesn't uh, control weed. It does control weeds, but it absolutely doesn't do anything for your fertility. you got to throw it away eventually. And uh, let's see. Oh, I was going to talk about different kinds of mulch. I have it written down here for you, but um, and I think I mentioned it before, the sawdusts or other things like cotton seeds if you live in that area or any kind of fine stuff you can use by uh, planting your seed. You actually just put that seed on top of the ground. Don't cover it at all and then cover it over with uh, sawdust. I think Gary was talking to him that it was hard to grow lettuce. Yeah. Well, I've never failed just sprinkling the lettuce seed on and then just sprinkle the sawdust on top. It's just perfect. It can, it can work really good. Now, this year I had a lot of hay. I got a good cutting of hay last fall and saved it all up for the spring. So, I did all my paths in hay. But then I did the tops in sawdust because I like the way the seeds can come right up through that sawdust so easy. If you live in a wheat area or rice, maybe you get straw. Same thing as hay, maybe even better. And anybody know any other things that they might be able to use for mulch that I hadn't thought of that maybe something special in your area? Hair is supposed to be real good. You get that for real, hair, yeah. You take a lot of hair, though, I guess. Uh, you mix it in with the other stuff. It's really supposed to be good. Yeah, you can't get it in my barbershop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so hair could be used, okay. I guess you get enough. Any other ideas? Yeah, pine needles will work. They really will. And you can go out, I can see there's a lot right out there. They could use it right here. Newspaper works too. Yeah, my, my neighbors have been using, they've been using the newspaper, and because it doesn't look so good, they put the hay on top of it. And it probably works real good that way. It double, it's a double thing, but I have to admit, there's some weeds that do come through the hay or, or straw. They will, but since your soil is kind of soft on the bed, it's, they're pretty easy to pull. They're once in a while, and, and they pull out pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, I've heard that when you use a newspaper, that the soil absorbs this heat and it gets into the ground. Isn't it? I I looked into it, and really most of your inks are based on soybean. Your print inks from newsprint. Mm -hmm. What do you know? What what's on your news on their house, Bill? No, I know these words. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I've used this paper, and I think people use it for the rest of Yeah, I would think so. What about I guess the same, same thing, it ought to work. Yeah, it probably would. Anything, the finer you get it, and that goes for your uh, compost pile, the finer you can get it, the uh, quicker it would decompose. I've read that you don't want to use the colored sections of the newspapers and you add like the crumbs and stuff like that because the dyes and that are still toxic but the black and white like you said it's mostly soy based based on the Yeah, you have to be kind of careful. Some people really go overboard on on their uh, precautions. Um, 
I may have really been off on that on that uh, steel slag we were talking about on the break. I did get that reference from a, a good organic gardening book. The, the author was John Seymour, and he recommended it. But he's from uh, England, so maybe there's some difference. Maybe he just used a small amount. He didn't say how much to use. But uh, I'd be aware that, according to what some of them almost told me, that it may not be good. But, um, you know, I, at the top here, I talk about the, the biodynamic method. And if you read there, it was it's popularized by Rudolf Steiner, the founder of the Anthroposophical Society. It's very close to the mysteries. Yep. And there, uh, I've noticed a lot of the gardening books will start talking about the magic crystals and magnets and so on. Um, they use special uh, cow horns packed with dung as a compost star, you have to put them in the ground for a year on the full moon, and on and on and on. It's, that sounds like a religion to me. And um, I, haven't, I haven't been able to explain, I haven't tried it, but I think probably... Yeah. So, they use some special stuff, just to let you know that I don't necessarily believe in it. Probably if they're if they're using beds and compost, that's probably what's what's doing the good for them. Uh, down at the bottom, I, I talk about deep digging. Well, if you really got a lot of energy, you can do this, and the way you do it. Okay. Anybody got a lot of energy? No. It warms you up if you do it in the winter time, but what you do is if you have a uh, a plot of land and let's say there's there's somebody with a lot of energy borrows a lot of time. If you don't go to work anywhere else, I guess you got a lot of time if you don't have a lot of energy. Well normally you can dig down one spade down and say just say 8 inches, 12 inches, and you've got a pretty well tilled garden. You turn that over and stir it up and loosen it up. But uh, if you wanted to, you could uh, dig out this part here, put it over here, then go a little bit further down, one more depth, and, uh, or at least loosen it up like with a fork, a spading fork rather than a shovel. And you've loosened it up very deep. And I say that the roots can penetrate. Most of them probably can go down that deep. One important thing, don't ever mix your subsoil with your hot soil. That's not good because um, you're actually making the top soil poorer is what you're doing. With time, if those earthworms can get down there, though, they only, they'll turn this subsoil into top soil. You'll find a lot deeper top soil in time. Then you, you put that back in, what you should do. But the, one way they say you can do that is to um, put that first one over here. Uh, let me start over there. Okay, we dig the first spade in, put it over here on this side. But then uh, the next one, you put it over here. Just keep on down the line. Some swear by it, they say that really helps out, and if you got the time and the, the energy, it probably wouldn't hurt. Anybody have a rotor tiller? Yeah. How do you like them? <laughs> do, do you do it on it? <laughs> yeah. Um, two kinds of rotor tillers. There's a front kind that has a rotating teeth in the front. Then there's a rear tine, rotating teeth in the back. The uh, front tine tends to be a lot harder to control, especially if your ground is, is tough, because it actually can pull you along and, and it can send you for a ride on, on hard ground. The rear tine has powered wheels 
that hold it back, that keep it from running away as those times dig into the ground. Does everybody know what a tiller is, basically, or have an idea what it is? But it has a gasoline engine, times that dig into the ground like a, a thousand midgets with hose chopping away real quick there. And it does a good job in, uh, it does things you probably couldn't do by yourself. And it makes it a lot easier. Uh, they sell different sizes, and I've had the biggest one that they make and the smallest one that they make. I'm speaking of one that was 24 inches wide, the one I have now is 18 inches wide. And I think the 18 inch one is better. I really do. It's so much easier to control than a big one. We have the, we have the mantis. Okay, well that's a real little one, isn't it? It's a real little one, and it's fantastic, and it's just incredible work. Now that one has a small two-stroke engine, like a chainsaw, right? Yeah. Okay. Jim? Uh, one point I recommend on it, you get a, a, a rear-driven killer. Uh-huh. You get one with large wheels, because the larger the wheels, the more traction. Mm -hmm. you get, I got one that's got tiny wheels and skin back, and then you got kind of the bones. Uh, I've got a man of all the Well, you must have good soil if you have to help it along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because if you have bad soil, they all, that thing will run away with you. They really will. But uh, uh, the brand that I favor is is called uh, Troy Bill. They're built strong. The uh, ones from Sears or uh, Western Auto or the, uh, they're cheaper and they're built cheaper and they may not last as long. I tell you, if I, uh, if I had my choice between my last tank of gas to drive somewhere and saving that gas for my rotor tiller, I'd save it for the rotor tiller. It's really worthwhile having. And they may cost you some money, but you can be surprised if you, if you um, look for a used one, they can be pretty cheap too. The one we have the Manus is a small one. It doesn't have any, it just has tines. Yeah. But it's guaranteed unconditional for the first two years, and after that, the tines are guaranteed forever. And we've been using it for over five years, and uh, we don't do anything to prepare it for the winter or the summer. When I pull it out in the spring, I pull it about five or six times, and it starts right up, and, and it's great. And it's not real expensive. It's probably real life easy to handle too. You can just yeah. pick it right up. Yeah. I've seen that ads for those. The uh, let's see, the only other thing about um, any questions on planting specific crops, specific types of seeds, how you would do that? Uh -huh. uh, back of the back. Hey, I guess this is a suggestion that, you know, if you, like, you know, plant lettuce as early as possible. Yeah. In, in areas where you have uh, frozen ground, you can put it out there right on top of the ground, frozen, and it'll come up and be found. You don't have to worry about it. And another thing I found when you're finding real small seeds, is put them in a salt shaker and you, you don't get so many in one spot. Yeah, I've done that too. And, and there's even something else you can take um, sand or something to dilute that seed, and it's even it's even better because when even though because since you're shaking just a small amount of seed, sometimes it's hard to see where you've even done it, especially if they're the same color as the soil. So if you add some sand or something light colored along with that, it dilutes it too. But also you can see where you. have where you've been working or been covered. That works real good. The um, the shaker, a pepper shaker or a salt shaker, depending on the size you want, mm -hmm. size of holes. Uh, the gardens are down in Texas, I don't know how they work up here, but I see no reason why it wouldn't work up here, is um, a lot of sand. Because it's rich in minerals and, and it will keep your, your soil from compacting on And it's just tremendous. You'll get a, a growth that's that's what Bill was saying earlier. Do you use lava sand as a fertilizer? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, that gets back to the, the origin of our soil, which is 
the weathering of rocks. And the closer you can get to that rock, the better off you are. I think there's probably, there's different ways the soil gets built up. It can get built up in a river situation. It can be, be built up by glaciers, ice, ice uh, pushing soil together and scraping. It can be built up by volcanoes, another one. Floods, which I guess that's like river soil. I don't believe this stuff about the wind blowing the hot soil away. Where did it blow it to? Well, you know, I, I recently saw a show on the, the dust bowl and then uh, and showed what it looked like before and after during the dust bowl. And then this year I, and last year I drove right through the dust bowl and it sure, they sure changed it back to something. It, and it was interesting what what uh, Miles was saying yesterday about the uh, the climate change that happened that happened at the end of the 1800s that probably contributed or would have contributed to the the end of the buffalo. And I wonder if the climate was a lot different when these pueblos were built. Maybe they had a lot more rain to work with. Well, the real answer to the dust bowl is what Miles said yesterday. The buffalo would have died out anyway because the climate changed and drought came to the plains. And here they were cultivating what had traditionally been grassland where there are no wind breaks. And when it dried up and the rain didn't come, well, even if they planted the, the plants started to sprout, it's like here in Arizona in some places, without outside water being applied to the current plants, all the time they won't grow because the, the wind just sucks the life right out of the plant and dehydrates them before they can get their root system established deep enough to be able to replenish the water that the wind is sucking out. So that's the real reason, that's the real reason for the so-called dust bowl. They were breaking ground and, and planting crops in a place that was becoming a drought place. Now you go through those states where the dust bowl had occurred before, and what you see is they planted huge lines of trees to break the wind, and they created artificial reservoirs and lakes, and they brought the groundwater table up. They put dams along the rivers, and there's probably just as many lakes in Oklahoma that there is now, or didn't used to be, that there is in probably any other state in the Union outside of maybe Wisconsin or Minnesota, <laughs> which is nothing but lakes. But you know, when I was talking about my farm in the Virgin Islands and how I had one strip of crop and one strip of grass and so on, the, uh, the Virgin Islands is marginal for the tropics. They got, uh, if they were lucky, they got 40 inches of rain. And of course, they had full time sun and wind along with that. So 40 inches north. It's not quite as much as 40 inches in the tropics, so they were sort of marginal. And not only did the uh, grass provide mulch, but it, it did a windbreak too. And um, I was there for Hurricane Hugo with 200 mile an hour winds. And I granted most all my crops were killed off, but just two weeks before the hurricane, I had planted little hot pepper seedlings. They survived 200 mile an hour hurricane winds, and that was the only thing that uh, I had left that continued to grow that was planted before the hurricane. And I got an article in Organic Garden about that. And that's it for today, folks, for the Hour of the Time. Be sure and tune in Monday for another episode of the Hour of the Time with yours truly, William Cooper. And we'll bring you up to speed on what's going on around here and what we're, uh, what we're doing about it. So don't miss that broadcast. It's going to be a very important one.
You're listening to 101.1 FM Eagles. 